bit of a rocky area around here. Well, so far what we've seen may not look like it's real familiar or look like it's actually reasoning. Uh, but all of what we've seen so far is going to be used to justify uh, the rules of implication. Uh, we're going to have rules of implication, and these are rules that allow us to make inferences. Now, we've been talking about validity. We tested the validity of premises and conclusions with these truth tables, which, which is fine. It's, it's not bad. But telling us that an argument is valid uh, is not the same thing as understanding the steps from the premises to the conclusion. And sometimes there's going to be more than a few. I wager that when y'all looked at some of these arguments with the truth tables, uh, you know, you had these premises and conclusions. Sometimes you looked at the conclusions and like, I don't think so. Well, the rules of implication uh, are valid. If we follow these rules properly, <laughs> using the premises, whatever we infer from these rules, whether they're surprising or not, whatever we infer from these rules, that's going to be valid. If these premises are true, these conclusions must be true. So we'll be using or we'll be solving lots of uh, uh, formalized arguments. And uh, when we look for a solution, we'll have a set of premises, which we already talked about when we looked at the sequence. We'll have a set of premises. And from these premises, we are going to try to infer that conclusion. Now, to be clear, we can infer lots <laughs> of conclusions, uh, but we're not going to look for all the possible ones. I would take forever, literally. Instead, we're going to look for you know, the specified conclusion given in the sequence. So we'll be solving these formula. We'll be solving these problems in logic. Uh, we're gonna, and I'm going to show you uh, these rules. I, actually, here, here we go, right? Let's take a look at just kind of a group shot of all these rules of implication so far. There's going to be more later on. But so far, these are the rules of implication we're, we'll, we'll be looking at. Uh, now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these rules uh, you know, in smaller chunks and use them to uh, draw inferences. As for the explanation of the, you know, the rules themselves, I, I'm going to go for that a little bit in this video, but I'm going to let you read the text more to get that, to get that fuller explanation. Now here, primarily, I'm going to show you how to uh, reach the conclusion from these premises using these rules. Hopefully, it won't be as rocky as this area. So the first set of rules we're going to look at deal with conjunctions. If you remember, as we got uh, from the text, uh, we got conjunction introduction and conjunction elimination. Uh, this is just a really fancy way of saying uh, we're going to, for conjunction introduction, we're going to create a conjunction using uh, two already agreed upon uh, truths. Right? Uh, and conjunction elimination just says, well, from the conjunction, Right? We're going we're to be able to infer either one of the conjuncts. Right? So you, you, uh, let's you know, take a look at a quick problem of this. Um, so, right. so here we have, uh, forgive me for using notes, I'm not quite as talented to remember all the problems at once. So here we have uh, two premises. We just had the atomic proposition P, and then we had the atomic proposition Q and R. And from this, we're trying to uh, trying to refer one big conjunction, P, conjoined with the other conjunction, Q and R. And so when you have a conjunction, right? so we look at the conclusion, we have a conjunction. When you have a conjunction, this should already tell you that, you know, there's a good chance here that the rule that you're going to use is conjunction introduction. And this is something to keep in mind. When you see the conclusion, spot what kind of complex proposition it is already. That can, not always, but can provide a clue as to the rule that's going to be used, at least at the end, to infer that conjunction. And as you're going to see in a little bit, you know, the first few problems we're going to look at are pretty straightforward, pretty simple. But as you see a little, little bit later on in this video, there might be several steps, many steps, 
uh, to reach the conclusion. And having said that, we have this conclusion uh, P and the conjunction, uh, P conjoined with the conjunction of Q and R. Well, again, this is a really simple thing. So we just look at the premises that we have available, our two assumptions, right, marked with A, and we find P and we find the conjunction of Q and R. This is not a difficult thing to figure out. We just simply use the rule conjunction introduction to infer that, that whole conjunction that we're looking for in the conclusion, P conjoined with the conjunction of Q and R. So again, not a difficult one. Let's look at something maybe uh, a, little bit, uh, a little bit different. All right. So this time, we've got P. We've got our, our same two uh, premises, right? We've got P and the conjunction of Q and R. But this time, instead of conjoining P to that other conjunction, we just want to conjoin P to R. Right? So you look at that conclusion. We've got P and R. Well, the conclusion is still a conjunction. But this time, right, we don't have P just simply, excuse me, we don't have R just simply by itself. So we can't just make a simple inference from P and, and at one line and R at another to P and R. We're still probably, since it's a conjunction, we're still probably going to use conjunction introduction at some point. But this first step, but it's not just a one stepper like the last one. Well, take a look at the premises that we have, take the, the two assumptions in lines one and two. Well, we got P and one. Well, hey, there we go. We already know one, one half of the conjunction is coming from. Then we got Q and R in line two. Okay, well, R. Right, this is, again, another clue when you're, when you're trying to solve these proofs. Find the atomic propositions in the premises. This is going to give you some clue as to which rules you use to infer the conclusion. Well, R, one part of that conclusion, in line two, R is part of a conjunction. Yeah, Q and R. Okay. Well, we need to infer or pull out that R from that conjunction. Well, conjunction elimination allows us to do this. From that conjunction Q and R, so we go to line three, that conjunction Q and R, we can infer just R, just R. Well, and then we give our citation line two from conjun using conjunction elimination. Well, now we have P on one line and, that, and R on another. We want to infer the conjunction of P and R so we can do that using lines one and three with conjunction introduction. Okay, let's take a look at one last problem for conjunctions. Uh, slight difference this time. <laughs> we have P for one premise, for one assumption, Q and R for another. Except this time we want to infer P and Q. Well, that's fine, we can, right? Using pretty much the same steps as before. The only difference here is that we're going to infer Q from the conjunction of Q and R. And this is fine with uh, conjunction elimination. You can infer either conjunct just using conjunction elimination. You can infer either one or you'll pull them out separately. That's, that's fine. You can do that. Uh, we can infer either conjunct from the conjunction, not just one or the other. And then we just simply can join P and Q together using our rule conjunction elimination. So the conjunction rules are not that complicated. Uh, and we're going to pretty much use the same strategy in solving all this proof. So you look at the conclusion, figure out one kind of complex proposition is there, and from that it's going to give us a clue as to what kinds of rules are available to us to infer that conclusion. Okay. And then you'll look at the premises, try to find the conclusion in there, where is it located in the premises, and what rules can you use to pull out those uh, atomic propositions, or sometimes complex propositions, but can you just pull them out of those premises to infer that conclusion. A little less rocky. I'm going to go this way. Okay, well, we got a fork in the road. Since uh, we can go either way, Seems like a good time to mis mention the uh, rules about disjunctions. Now, disjunctions, we got two main rules for now, right? Two main rules for disjunction. Uh, we got disjunctive syllogism, right? and we've got disjunctive introduction. Right? Now, disjunctive syllogism allows us to uh, uh, take a disjunction, the disjunction is true, and if we have the negation of one of the disjuncts, Remember, disjunctions are subcontrary. At least one must be true. 
If we have the negation of a disjunct, then we can infer the other disjunct. So from the claim that at least one of these atomic propositions, or one of these propositions is true, we have the negation of one, we can include the other. So that's disjunctive syllogism. Disjunctive introduction allows us to infer a disjunction. Now we can infer a disjunction pretty much from anything. I know this sounds weird, but remember, a disjunction just claims that at least one of these propositions is true. Well, if we already have something that's true, I am outside. I can infer a disjunction. I am outside or I am inside. Now, it's in fact true that I'm outside. Okay, but remember, we're just concerned about validity. If I am outside is true, the disjunction, either I am outside or am I, ins or I am inside, is also true. So that's disjunctive introduction. It seems a little weird. I mean, you could literally <laughs> you can infer disjunction with anything if you really want to, right? So again, from the proposition, I am outside, we can infer either I'm outside or I had a turkey sandwich for lunch. We can infer either I'm out, I am outside or uh, there are 13 space colonies on Mars. We can infer either, either I am outside or uh, Gandalf the Grey really wants me to go on a quest. <laughs> we can really infer pretty much anything, any disjunction, excuse me, we can infer any disjunction from one of the disjuncts. That's what disjunction introduction allows us to do. So if you see a disjunction as a conclusion, well, that you know, might be it's a decent chance that that dis or at least a possibility to say <laughs> that the rule used to infer that disjunction that, that could be just dis disjunction introduction. It's not the only possibility, but it, it's at least a clue. Okay, so let's take a look at a couple of problems then using disjunction introduction and the disjunctive syllogism, and, and really we're going to help ourselves to conjunction introduction and conjunction elimination as well. Okay, so here's here's a, a, a problem. We got two premises, P is the first premise, Q is the second. And from this we want to infer P or R, the disjunction P or R, and Q. Okay, well something to, you know, take a close look at that conclusion. We have a disjunction, which seemingly appears out of nowhere. That's a clue that disjunction introduction might be used. Right? We have a disjunction that seemingly appears out of nowhere, and it's conjoined to Q. Since the entire conclusion is a conjunction, we probably use conjunction introduction to infer that conjunction. Right? Now, I want to oh, I want to make a word of caution here. Con disjunction introduction allows us to infer any disjunction we please from a, a, a single proposition. Or sorry, <laughs> any disjunction containing the proposition from that single proposition, right? So if we have P, we can infer P or Q. If we have P, we can infer P or R. If we have P, we can infer P or the conjunction Q and T. If we have P, we can infer P or the uh, conditional S or T, right? This, we can infer any disjunction we please from a single proposition as long as that proposition is contained in the disjunction. You cannot do this with conjunction introduction. Conjunction introduction, <coughs> both conjuncts have to already appear in your list of, of premises. Right? So I just want to make that clear. All right. So we've got the, so the conclusion here is P or R conjoined with Q. All right. So look for the conclusion. Look for the component propositions and the available premises. Well, we just got P and we got Q. Well, they're Q, right? That's one half of the conjunction is Q. The other half is P or R. And so far, we don't have it, right? That's not, that doesn't appear in our list of premises. But we do have P, right? That's one half of that disjunction there in the conclusion. We do have P. Well, from P, we'll go down to line three. From P, we can infer the disjunction P or R. Okay, this problem is mostly solved. Right? We can infer the, con the disjunction P or R from that first line P using disjunction and introduction. That's fine. Now we can conjoin P or R to Q. 
And that's our conclusion, line four, uh, using lines two and three and the rule conjunction introduction. Let's try another one. Okay, so this time we have a disjunction and we have a conjunction. That's our premises. The disjunction is P or Q and the conjunction is not P and not R. And we, what, what we want to infer is Q. Okay, so now we have a single, prop, a single atomic proposition as the conclusion. Uh, it's not really any help to tell us necessarily which rule we can use. So you have to go hunting through the premises to find the conclusion. Right? And we find the conclusion Q as one half of a disjunction and line one. We got P or Q. Well, if we want to get one half of a disjunction out, we use a good candidate for this is the negation of the other disjunct. This is using disjunctive syllogism. And we have P or Q. If we want Q out of there, using disjunctive syllogism, uh, we need not P. Well, where's not P? Not P is in line two in a conjunction. Now, we simply just can't, you know, say, oh, well, lines one and two are disjunctive syllogism. No, right? Because the half of that disjunction is not a conjunction. <laughs> uh, instead, we need to pull not P out of that conjunction hmm, to use for the disjunctive syllogism. So let's do that. We already have a rule that lets us do that, conjunction elimination. So we pull not P out of the conjunction in line three using conjunction elimination. Then we can infer Q right, using disjunctive syllogism. And that's how we get Q finally out of that disjunction. And so far, so good. All right, so you notice, got two steps there that time. A little bit more to it. Right. So these are the rules. We got disjunction elimination. Oh, excuse me, we got disjunction introduction. <laughs> we got disjunction introduction. And we have disjunctive syllogism. Disjunctive introduction, disjunctive syllogism. We have one more rule about uh, disjunctions. We're not going to cover that to the end because it actually combines a, a couple of different things. Um, well, that's going to get us started with disjunctions. So, so far we've covered conjunctions and disjunctions. This area is safe on the condition you don't go and jumping off any rocks. <laughs> That's my really clumsy way of trying to introduce conditionals. So you remember conditionals, so if P then Q, and this expresses the truth relation of sufficiency. P is sufficient for Q. It also expresses necessity. Q is necessary for P, one step at a time. Right. So we got, we're going to start with two rules with conditions. You have modus ponens and modus tollens. Now what modus ponens allows us to infer is the consequent of a conditional. It allows us to infer the consequent of a conditional when we can assert the antecedent. So if I have if P then Q, and I also have P, well then I can infer the consequent. Modus tollens allows us to infer the negation of the antecedent, not the antecedent, the negation of the antecedent from the negation of the consequent, not the consequent. So you can't take if P then Q, assert Q, therefore we can include P. No, right. that, that's a fallacious inference. That's called uh, affirming the consequent. It's a classic uh, uh, deductive fallacy. Similarly, a classical deductive fallacy is uh, denying the antecedent. That's where you take a conditional, you say that uh, the antecedent is false, therefore the consequent is false. No, <laughs> that is uh, a classic uh, uh, deductive fallacy called denying the antecedent. But we do have modus ponens and we do have modus tollens. You might even think of modus ponens as affirming the consequent. 
that's, excuse me, affirming, <laughs> affirming the antecedents, right? We affirm the antecedent, therefore we can affirm the consequent. You could think of modus tollens as denying the consequent. We deny the consequent, therefore we can deny the antecedent. <clears throat> so, you know, conditional works one way, right? Most of the time. There, conditionals can run both ways, but it, it doesn't get that automatically. All right. So modus ponens, we have if P, then Q. We also have P, therefore we can in infer Q. Modus tollens, we have if P, then Q. We have the denial of Q, therefore we have the denial of P. All right. Let, let's see how this works. Well, let's try a couple of problems here. All right. Okay. So we have this. We have uh, uh, two lines for our argument. We have the assertion of P. Then we have the disjunction of P or Q, and that's a, the antecedent of a conditional. We have the disjunction of P or Q, uh, then R. Right? And what we're trying to do is we're trying to infer R. Okay, so let's take this step by step. We look at our uh, uh, conclusion, R, and we try to find it in our premises. Well, lo and behold, it's the consequent of a conditional. Cool. Right? We have R as a consequent of a conditional. Chances are we're going to use <laughs> a modus ponens to get that consequent out. Yeah. But then, so we look at the antecedent, P or Q. Well, P or Q does not appear as a premise. Well, what are we supposed to do? Well, does any part of that antecedent appear in the premise? Yes, it does. Right? We got P in line one. Well, we need the disjunction P or Q. If only we had a rule that allowed us to infer a disjunction from a premise that already was given. Well, we do, right? It's disjunction introduction. So we take that first line P and we infer the disjunction P or Q. And from that inference, I mean, oh, sorry, sorry, from that disjunction, we have P or Q. Well, that's the antecedent of a conditional. <clears throat> so we take lines two and three together and we can now infer R using modus ponens. Modus ponens allows us to infer the consequent of a conditional when we have the antecedent. Let's try another problem. We got P or Q. We have P. Wow, so far so good. Easy peasy. Well, the conclusion is Q or R. Huh. Where does Q or R exist? Where is it present in the premises? Not anywhere, right? We don't have the disjunction Q or R. And you might, uh, but still, you know, we have that disjunction. So maybe, maybe, maybe disjunction, since the conclusion is a disjunction, we already talked about how, uh, you know, that can be a nice clue as to what rule we're going to have to use. It, well, if the conclusion is a disjunction, we might have to use disjunction introduction. Okay, well, let's look through the premises. Do we have anything in there from where we can include, use conjunction, a disjunction introduction? Well, we've got Q in line one. P is not going to be any help to us, but we got Q in line one. So maybe if we get Q out of there, we can use disjunction introduction on it and for Q or R. Well, as luck has it, <laughs> we, Q is the consequent of a conditional and we have the uh, we have the antecedent in line two. So in line three, we can infer the consequent. We can infer the consequent. That's Q. And then line four, we can infer the disjunction from that consequent, right? So now we got Q or R from uh, uh, using modus ponens to get Q out of there. Now we got Q or R. Okay. Let's try another problem because this, this stuff can get interesting real fast. Let's look at this one. Whoa! What's this Q or R and T then S business? What the heck is that? And R and the, the conditional T or S is not anywhere in our two premises, we've only got two premises. Well, remember, that's a disjunction. Q or and all that mess that's behind it. Okay. Do we have R and if T then S? Any? No, we don't. But we got Q. Q is the consequent of a conditional. Huh? So we've got, and we've got the antecedent there with P. So now we can infer Q using modus ponens again. All right, so far so good. What do we get? Well, we can just simply infer the disjunction of Q or all that mess. That's what disjunction introduction allows us to do. We can infer any disjunction 
from a proposition provided that proposition that that disjunction contains that proposition. No problem. Now, I know that seems weird, but you can do that with disjunction introduction. It is completely valid. Go ahead and construct a truth table if you don't believe me. Take those two premises and that conclusion. You'll still get uh, uh, you, you, you'll still get a completely valid uh, uh, truth table there. Completely valid argument. Okay. Let's try another problem. This one's a little different. We've got the conditional if P then Q. We have the negation of Q. Then we have P or R. And the conclusion we're looking for is R. Okay. Well, let's take this step by step. The conclusion isn't any particular complex proposition, so it's not necessarily a clue there in what rule we might use to find it. So we just have R. Well, where, where is R? Well, R is in line three as one half of a disjunction. Well, if we want to get that, that half out, right, we have to have the negation of the other one. Okay. So we have, if P, or, sorry, we have the disjunction P or R. We want to get R out of there, so we need not P. Well, where's not P? Well, not P is anywhere in there. Right? We don't have a not P. But we do have P. Right? P is the antecedent of a conditional in line one. All right, well, we can't infer antecedents using any, any rule, but we can infer the negations of antecedents. All right. We, use the negate, we can infer the negations of antecedents using modus tollens if we have the negation of the consequent. Lo and behold, line two, we have the negation of the consequent. So from that negation of the consequent, right, we have the negation of the antecedent. That's what we can infer in line four using lines one and two of modus tollens. And then we can infer R in line five right, uh, using that, dis that disjunction P or R. Well, since we have not P in line four, we can just infer R. Okay. Well, that's kind of nice. We're able to pull that out. All right. Let's see. Let's try another problem. Okay. We've got if P then Q. We've got if Q then R and not R. Ooh. All right. And what we want to infer is not P and not Q. Okay. So we've got a conclusion that's a conjunction. Well, it's probably since it's a conjunction, there's a chance we'll use conjunction introduction to get that conjunction. All right. Well, let's look at our uh, premises. Do we have not P and not Q anywhere in there? Well, no, we don't. Right? We don't have not P and not Q. Um, do we have the parts of it? Well, okay, well, we got P and we got Q in lines one and two, but they're antecedents of a conditional. We can infer antecedents, but we can infer the negations of antecedents if we have the negation of the consequent using modus tollens. All right, well, we have the negation of the antecedent of line uh, of, of two, excuse me. We have the negation of the consequent of the conditional in line two, that's not R. Well, then using lines two and three, line two says if Q then R, and in line three you have not R, so we can infer not Q using lines one and two, excuse me, using lines two and three and modus tollens. Cool. Well, that's one half of the conjunction. What about the other half? The other half is in line one. All right. Well, guess what? We just infer the negation of the consequent <laughs> of uh, the conditional in line one. Okay. Well, now we can use that negation, not Q, to, uh, and we use that negation, not Q in line four, and the conditional in line one to infer not P. Groovy. So now we got both half of our, of our conjuncts. We got not Q in line four. We got not P in line five. Well, then using conjunction introduction, we can infer the conjunction not P and not Q. That's our conclusion. All right. So modus ponens and modus tollens allow us to pull out in some way, shape, or form parts of the conditional, right? Modus ponens allows us to pull out the consequent of a conditional when we have the antecedent. Modus tollens allows us to pull out the negation of the antecedent when we have the negation of the consequent. But we want to be clear, we can't infer antecedents from consequence. We can't do that. 
And we can't infer the negations of consequence using the negations of antecedents. We can't do that either. That is not modus tonens. That is not modus ponens. All we can do is infer consequence from the affirmations of antecedents, and we can infer the negations of antecedents with the negations, from the negations of consequence. All right. Well, that was cool, but let's look at two more, pro, two more uh, inference rules using conditions. I like you guys, but I'm not walking down that path to get an interesting shot. Yeesh. Uh, that looks a little hazardous. You know, if I were to go down that path, then, you know, maybe bad things would happen. It's not to say that bad things have happened, or even that I'm going to go down that path. I'm just saying if. Well, that if, that's a hypothetical. <laughs> If I were to walk down that way, you know, bad things might happen. Well, we, we can make inferences that are conditions. Right? And we got, we got two rules that allow us to do this, right? Uh, one rule is called hypothetical syllogism. And another rule is called uh, conditional proof. You know, now here's a little tip, right? So we've looked at different rules. If your conclusion is a conjunction, chances are, there's a good chance you can use conjunction introduction for that rule. If your conclusion is contained in a conjunction, you're probably going to have to use conjunction elimination for, uh, as a rule. All right. If your conclusion is a disjunction, chances are there's at least a possibility that you're going to use disjunction introduction for that, uh, for that uh, uh, inference, right? Um, if your conclusion is part of it, one half of a disjunction, chances are you're going to have to use disjunctive syllogism for, uh, uh, to, to get to that conclusion. Not, the, you're not just like a one-stepper, but you know, it's part of the way. <clears throat> well, we got two rules that allow us to infer conditionals. We already dealt with conditionals before. We got modus ponens and modus tollens, but that doesn't allow us to infer a conditional, just allow us to allow us, to allow us to infer either the consequent of a condition, provided we have the antecedent, or the negation of the antecedent, provided we have the negation of the consequent. Hypothetical syllogism and conditional proof allow us to infer conditionals. So chances are, there's at least a chance that if your conclusion is a conditional, you might have to use hypothetical syllogism or conditional proof for that. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, a problem here. All right. So this should kind of look familiar. <laughs> we already saw this earlier uh, with using modus ponens and modus tollens. Um, but you know, here we have if P then Q, and we have if Q then R, and then not R. And the conclusion is not P. Well, it shouldn't be hard to figure out, since we kind of already did it, that since the conclusion is the negation of an antecedent of one of the conditionals, we're probably going to use modus tollens to get that out. OK. So in order to do that, we need not Q. Well, Q is not anywhere in there, but it's contained as the antecedent of a conditional. And, and, and so if you know, it's the negation of its antecedent, we're probably going to use um, modus tollens to get that out. Okay. And wouldn't you know, we have the negation, we have you know, not R, and that's the negation of that consequent. Okay. So far, so good. But it'd be nice if we could just have that conditional if P then R. Right, and then use not R to infer not P. Well, we can do that. That's what hypothetical syllogism allows us to do. So look at lines one and two. We have if P then Q. That says that P is sufficient for Q. That's line one. We have line two, Q, if Q then R. That says Q is sufficient for R. Okay. That says Q is sufficient for R. Well, if P is sufficient for Q and Q is sufficient for R, well, that means P is sufficient for R. So using lines... Uh, 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 one and two, right? Using lines one and two, we can infer if P then R using hypothetical syllogism. Right. Well, then now we have not R. We have not R uh, as one of our uh, assumptions there in line three. 
right? We have not R is our assumption there, line three. Well, then using not R and the conditional if P then R, well, then we can infer not P using modus tollens, using lines three and four modus tollens. It's pretty straightforward. Okay, let's try something a little more different. Whoa, look at that. That is a complicated formula. P is one half of a disjunction. The other half is a conjunction of two negations, <laughs> not S and not T. That's our only premise. And what we want to infer is if not P, then not T. Yeesh. Well, our singular premise is a disjunction. So we're not going to be able to use hypothetical syllogism, at least not immediately, to infer the conclusion. What are we going to do? Well, well, let's take a look at that disjunction, right? Uh, let's take a look at that conclusion. We want to get if not P, then not T. All right. Well, where is not T? Not T is one half of that conjunction. Right? And it's that conjunction is inside, is inside a disjunction. Well, it would be great if we had that one half of the, if we can get that part of the disjunction out. If only we could assume not P. Well, we can for the purposes of demonstrating a conditional. Right? So we can assume not P. That's what that ACP means. We can assume not P. And frankly, in logic, you can assume whatever the heck you like. You can't infer whatever the heck you like, but you can assume whatever the heck you like. Right? So we're going to assume not P for the purposes of a conditional proof, for the purposes of inferring a condition. Right? So just like on the assumption I were to walk down that path, something bad would happen. I'm not walking down the path. Something bad hasn't happened. But if, right, if on the assumption I walk down that path, something bad would happen. Same thing here. If we're going to assume not P. Well, if we assume not P, then we can infer not S and not T using lines one and two in disjunctive syllogism. Great. So we've got that not S and not T. We need to pull out that not T. Since it's a conjunction, we can do that quite easily using conjunction elimination. We, uh, so, we, so line four, we pull out not T from the conjunction in line, two, uh, line three. Right? So we've assumed not P. From that assumption, we've in inferred not T. Great. Magnificent. Since we inferred not T using that assumption, we can infer a conditional. If not P, then not T. We haven't said not P is true. We just assumed it for the sake of proving a conditional. We haven't said not T is true. We just assumed, we just inferred it from the assumption, right? I haven't gone down that path, but if, if we assume we, I did, if we assume I did, what would follow is bad things would happen. That's how you infer that that's uh, that's how you can infer a conditional using conditional proof. Okay. So just to be clear, we haven't said not P is true. We've only assumed it for the sake of uh, proving the conditional. We haven't inferred not T. We've only inferred it on the assumption. So we get to infer if not P, then not T. Let's try something else. Wow, this looks weird, doesn't it? If P, then Q. And if R, then S. Those are our two premises. Right? And we want to infer if Q, then R, then if P, then S. Boy, golly. Take it easy on us, Dr. Haugen. <laughs> it's actually not as complicated as it looks. Look at the complex proposition, right? The conclusion is a complex proposition. It's a conditional. That means, I mean, here's two good clues, right? You're either going to use hypothetical syllogism or conditional proof for that. Well, if it's hypothetical syllogism, do we have, what, a conditional where uh, Q then R is an antecedent followed by a consequent, and then, you know, <laughs> that consequent appears another conditional with the P then S? No, right? That, we don't have that nice handy chain as it stands. So we're probably going to have to use conditional proof. Right? So we've got our two premises, if P then Q, and we've got if R then S, all right? We want to infer if P then S. How could we infer if P then S? Well, we can infer if P then S, just if P then S, if we had a linking conditional, namely if Q then R, right? If we had a linking conditional, 
Right. If P then Q, and if Q then R, and if R then S, then we can infer if P then R, and then we can infer if P then S, using hypothetical syllogism. But we don't have that condition. But we could assume it. Right? So let's assume for the purpose of conditional proof. If you assume for the purpose of conditional proof, you better infer a conditional from that. Right? Uh, so let's assume for the purpose of conditional proof, if Q then R. Well, great, now we got our linking chain. So then we can infer if P then R, using if P then Q and if Q then R, you know, that Q then R is our, our assumption, that's lines one and three, uh, for using hypothetical syllogism, right? Then we can, so we got if P then R, and we got also R then S there, so using lines two and, and uh, uh, four, not using lines two and four, we can now infer if P then S, using hypothetical syllogism. Cool. We've reached the consequent of that conditional. Now we assumed the antecedent of the condition in the conclusion, right? In the conclusion, we assume the antecedent of Q then R. We infer if P then S, so we can infer a conditional. Well, that uh, so for the conclusion, if Q then R, then if P then S. That's our conclusion. Conditional proof looks a little weird. We don't like making assumptions. We think making assumptions is bad for logic. No, it's not true. You can make assumptions all the time. You just can't make assumptions as a conclusion. <laughs> I can make assumptions for the purpose of proving something in the conclusion. Okay. You know, that assumption has to be noted and is noted as a conditional. I can't just assume the conclusion and walk away. If I'm going to make an assumption, I better be inferring uh, a conditional or later on, as we'll see, I better be inferring a disjuncture with dilemma. Uh, so I can't just assume the conclusion and walk away, but I can assume the antecedent for the purpose of inferring the consequent and then conclude a conditional where the assumption is the antecedent of why I infer it as a consequent, right? All right, let's try another one. We got a conditional, if P then R. And now we got an even more complicated conditional, if Q then Another, you know, then the conditional is a consequent. Q, then the, the, the conjunction Q and R. Oy fey. Well, look, <laughs> this can get odd, right? If you try to backtrack it all the way from the conclusion backwards, you might get a little bit lost. But looking at the conclusion, we can see that it's a conditional, right? And we have a single premise. If we have a single premise, we're not using hypothetical syllogism to prove this. So if we have a conditional as, a, as the conclusion, we don't have anything else for hypothetical syllogism. We're probably going to use conditional proof. So without even trying to backtrack and figure it out ahead of time, just assume P. See what happens. <laughs> so we're just going to assume P. Okay. But you notice we've got another conditional right, as the consequent of the conclusion. So we have if P, then if Q, then Q and R. Okay, well, it, you know, we really don't have anything where Q implies R or anything like that, right? In fact, Q is just nowhere to be found in our assumptions. Well, it, here's the thing. You can assume more than one uh, premise, right? You can assume more than one antecedent. So we've got the assumption that P, and from that, on the assumption that Q, well, okay, well, let's go ahead and assume Q. All right, so we'll assume P in line two, we'll assume Q in line three. That's fine. You can do that. Then what we're going to do is take Q right, and make an inference. <laughs> we take Actually, we already have P. We can already use P. We you know, have Q. We can make an inference. And from that, we'll infer our, 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 our conditions. So we've got Q right there in line three. Well, we also have P in line two. Well, from P, line two, from that assumption in line one, we can infer R, right? Okay, so now we got R in line four using lines one and two modus ponens. That's great. Well, now we can infer our conjunction. We got Q and R, lines three and four, Q and R. Well, since we, we inferred Q and R from our assumptions, well, we can, we can infer a conditional. We got Q, we assume Q in line three, and from that we infer Q and R. So now we have a conditional, if Q, then Q and R. Great, right? Great. Lines three and five, you, you know, in conditional proof, the first number you cite is the assumption you made for the purpose of conditional proof. Five is the line where you draw the inference, right? And then you rule, the rule is conditional proof. So lines three, because that's where we assumed, 
Q, lines five, uh, line five, that's where we infer Q and R. So then we can infer if Q, then Q and R. Okay. Well, now, if Q, then if Q, then, I'm uh, sorry, if Q, then Q and R, that's an inference we made on the assumption of P. So now we can infer another conditional. Right? We have if P, then if Q, then Q and R. That's a, you know, it's a mouthful, right? <laughs> but this is fine. Right? We've got our, uh, we got this conditional. So line two, that's where, we, that's where we assumed P to begin with. Line six, that's where we inferred the consequent. So that's our citation. And then our uh, rule for justifying this is conditional proof. Wow, that was a lot. But it's really not as complicated as it seems. When you see a conditional like this, right? You got a conditional that has a conditional as its consequent, that has a conditional as its consequent, right? This can go on for a long ways. Just make the assumptions, right? Just make the assumptions. Um, if you got an ant and, and you're convinced it's going to be conditional proof, <laughs> just make the assumptions. Here's my warning though: work from left to right. So if you've got a a, a, a conclusion, you know, if P then Q. That's good. If P, then if we assume Q, then if we assume R, then if we assume S, right, then assume P, Q, R, and S in order, right? Work from left to right in the conditional. Okay, let's try another one. All right. Oh, never mind. That was the last one. We tried for that. <laughs> so that's hypothetical syllogism and conditional proof. And that allows us to infer uh, a conditional. I uh, said on the assumption that I go down there, bad things will happen. No, I'm not going to go down there. That doesn't necessitate bad things aren't going to happen, but let's hope so. Pretty cool path down there. Looks like some neat sights. Uh, well, I, I can either go down the path or I can go back home. Right. Either go down the path or I go back home. If I go down the path, uh, you know, it's getting pretty late. I'll probably be out here a while, right? The path goes down a ways, it's a long path. Um, if I go down the path, I'll be out here a while. If I go back home, uh, I can get my dinner on time, more or less. <laughs> And, you know, you've been watching a while and you probably figured out that I, I don't like to have dinner late. <laughs> I don't like to skip dinner at all, frankly. But, okay, so either I go down the path or I go home. Right? That's the disjunction. Either I go down the path or I go home. If I go down the path, I'll, be, I'll stay out here late. If I go down the path, I'll stay out here late. If I go back home, I'll get my dinner on time. Right? So... Either I'm going to go down the path or I'm going to go home. And from that disjunction, we can infer either I'll stay out late or I'll get my dinner on time. Okay, this is what's called a dilemma. This, this inference is called a dilemma. I said earlier, if you have a disjunction as the conclusion, there's a good chance that you use disjunction introduction as the rule. Well, dilemma is the other one, right? Dilemma is the other one. Dilemma says, I, I know in common speak, we, we say dilemma and we mean like a choice that we should make, but we really don't want to. <laughs> well, that's not what dilemma means. Dilemma means uh, you have a disjunction. At least one of these is true. Each disjunct infers something else. So we can infer disjunction from that inference. That's what a dilemma is. Now, I have the example in the text. I have the example in the text. I'm going to take you through it just a little bit step-by-step step so you can see what's going on. So uh, we have a disjunction, if P then Q. We have a conditional, if P then R. We have another disjunctional, if Q then S. And we want to infer is if R then S. Now we look at that conclusion, R then S. See? Well, is it anywhere in the premises? Well, R, both R and, and S are consequence of conditionals. Okay, cool. So you might think, well, I'll just infer one and then infer a disjunction from it with the other one, right? And then I'm done. Well, you, you can try that, but 
as you can see, right, so if we just take if P then R, P is not an antecedent. Uh, P, P is the antecedent. P is not available as a premise anywhere. It's in a disjunction, P or Q. If we're going to get P out of there, we have to have not Q, but we don't have not Q anywhere, right? Okay, so we're, we're probably going to need to use the lemma. Since P or Q is, is available as the first premise, and both P and Q are antecedents to those conditionals, well, then we can infer a disjunction. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, remember we did assuming for the sake of conditional proof. Now we're going to assume for the sake of dilemma. All right, now we're going to assume for the sake of dilemma. And just to kind of talk you through it, you assume one half of the disjunction, draw the inference, assume the other half of the disjunction, draw the inference, then we can infer the, the uh, disjunction, right? So we're going to assume P in line four, right? We assume P, and that AD there means assuming for the sake of disjunction. So we assume for the sake of disjunction. Well, it's very quickly we can infer R. So we uh, uh, infer R using line four and line two and modus ponens. So now we got R out of there. Okay, we got one half of the disjunction that's in the conclusion R or S. Now we got to get the other half. Well, we get the other half from Q. So we've already gotten R, we can move on to the next, disjun next disjunction. Let's assume Q, we assume Q. And again, <coughs> we can, uh, using, again, we cite it for assuming for the sake of disjunction. Again, using modus ponens lines three and six, we can infer S. So we've made the uh, inference from one half of the disjunction. We've made another inference from the other half of the disjunction. Therefore, we can conclude a disjunction of those inferences, R and S. So look at the citation there. Okay, the first number in the citation, that's the disjunction we're working with. The second number in the citation is the assumption of the first disjunct. The third number, so that's P, right? So the first number is P or Q. The second number is where we assume P. The third number, that's where we draw that inference from that assumption. The fourth number is where we assume the other disjunct, and the fifth number is the inference from that, that second assumption. So it's a long citation, but all it's saying is, look, first we got the dis this disjunction, then, so first we got the disjunction, the second number is here's the assumption of one half of the disjunct, the third number is the inference we got from that uh, uh, assumption. The fourth number is where we made the other assumption, right, the other half of the disjunct, and the fifth number is where we drew that inference from that second assumption. That's what's going on. So, right, the first number is either I go down the path or I go back home. The second number is, well, let's assume I go down the path. The third number is, on the assumption that I go down the path, I will be out here late. The fourth number is, let's assume I go home, right? The fifth number is, uh, I'll get my dinner on time. So we draw the inference, either I'll stay out late or I'll get my dinner on time. That's how that works. Now, dilemma doesn't always need conditionals. You can make inferences with whatever rules that we have. Right? You can make inferences with whatever rules that we have. So, let's try this. Right? Let's try another problem. We have a disjunction, P or Q, and we have an, uh, uh, another premise, R. Okay, well, what we want to infer is another disjunction, P and R or Q and R. Now, this should be too hard to figure out what we're going to do at this point. <laughs> so we have the disjunction and we have R. Uh, well, let's assume one half of the disjunction, P. That's our line three. Well, using R and P, we can infer the conjunction, P and R, using conjunction introduction. That's one half of the uh, disjunction. Let's assume the other half of the disjunction, Q. From that, we can assume Q and R. We can assume Q and R. That's the other half of the disjunction. So we can infer that whole disjunction, P and R or Q and R. Now, you know, just keep in mind, that's pretty straightforward, but you could do things like Assume for the sake of conditional proof within the uh, uh, assumption for dilemma, right? That, you know, these are possible. We could do modus ponens, modus ponens, all right. That, all that's possible. We don't have to just use conditionals. We don't just have to use conjunction introduction. Any inference we draw from that assumption, that's going to be that half of the disjunction, all right?
Okay. Well, that's uh, that's a, a dilemma. And that's all the rules we're going to use right now. We're going to have more rules later on. We're going to have equivalence rules, and we're going to have rules about complex, further complex propositions, using complex truth relations, one step at a time. This set of rules will get us started, and with it, uh, we're going to start solving our problems. Right? Now, I'm going to go back and get dinner.